In the early 19th century, Edinburgh was vibrant with the pulse of history, a city of dramatic vistas and original thinking, of clubs and scientific societies, of some scholars disputing the origin of the earth and others laying the foundations of modern economics. It was also a city where wealth and poverty walked the streets together, a place of stark social divisions, of evil and enlightenment. There were two Edinburghs, the prosperous new town, where ladies were born in gilded sedan chairs, and the old town, a major concentration of poverty and misery. With no public services or sanitation, an absence of pipe water, and with sewage thrown from the windows of tenements into the streets below, disease was rife in the old town. The steam intellect movement in the 19th century attempted to ameliorate this problem by providing educational opportunities for the working class. These initiatives embraced a complex of institutions in Edinburgh, including mutual improvement societies, public lectures, adult libraries, lecture societies and mechanics institutes. The development of steam intellect in Britain was voluntary, haphazard and incidental. But the most important steam intellect initiative was unquestionably that of mechanics institutes. It was in Glasgow where admission of artisans to study natural philosophy was pioneered in the 18th century by John Anderson when he issued craftsmen with free tickets to attend his classes. Furthermore, George Birkbeck was the first to introduce a free class for working tradesmen at the Anderson Institution of Glasgow in 1800. The idea of an institution, however, was original to Leonard Horner, as the seed sown in Glasgow later bore institutional fruit in Edinburgh. Horner, therefore, founded the first ever Mechanics Institute, specifically to educate the skilled working classes, and he formulated the pedagogy, the detailed syllabus, the financial plan and the form of governance. Horner was a child of the Scottish Enlightenment and was inspired by the conviction, first promulgated by Bacon, that the advancement of knowledge depends upon its application and that learning must be put to social use. Important questions about Horner's concept, which I shall examine in this lecture, include the following. What was the nature of the ideological and intellectual air that the founders were breathing that informed the curriculum of the Edinburgh School of Arts? What ideological perspectives influenced the governance and the curriculum of the institutes? What social and moral benefits did Horner expect the students to derive from the limited educational programme on offer? And to what extent did Horner influence the subsequent development of the Mechanics Institute movement? James Mill, a Scotsman educated at Edinburgh University, came to London in 1802 and formed a friendship with Jeremy Bentham that was to act as the nucleus of the radical movement. He believed in the power of education to lift the mass of people to a higher intellectual level. Mill conceptualised educational change as part of an essential aspect of a wider social transformation. There was a contradiction, however, at the heart of utilitarian educational philosophy that became clear when Mill posed and answered the question, what sort of education is required for the different classes of society? Mill proposed to perpetuate existing class relations by envisaging an educational system restricted on class lines, thereby revealing the contradiction at the heart of the utilitarian theory of education. This was the philosophy underpinning the actions of Leonard Horner and the middle-class Whigs of Edinburgh in his venture to provide scientific education for the artisan class. Following a conversation with Robert Bryson, a clock and watchmaker on South Bridge, who stated that his workmen were unable to attend mathematics classes, Horner realised that his concept of the Edinburgh School of Arts might be a viable one. He then drew up a preliminary plan and circulated it amongst master mechanics 
to identify the names of men who might benefit from his scheme. Within a fortnight, between 70 and 80 names had been put down and Bryson arranged for students to register at his shop. Several gentlemen from the Edinburgh Whig elite met and formed a committee to bring Horner's plan to fruition. Lord Henry Coburn, the Solicitor General, who presented the Scottish Reform Bill in 1832, asserted that the whole merit both of its conception and of its first three or four years' management is due exclusively to Leonard Horner. The prospectus that Horner outlined for the Edinburgh School of Arts in April 1821 articulated narrow utilitarian objectives to teach industrious tradesmen the principles of mechanics, chemistry and other branches of science that are of practical application in their several trades. The curriculum was predominantly scientific, practical rather than theoretical, applied science simplified in presentation, descriptive and not theoretically informed. The natural sciences lay at the heart of the initial mechanics institutes. The steam engine sat on the lecturer's table, along with the geological hammer, the butterfly net, the phrenological bust and the globe. Science, because of its alleged objectivity and value neutrality, free from political implications, did not divide Whigs and Tories who could then collaborate in its provision. It was not intended to teach specific trades such as carpentry. The social class factor influenced the nature of provision since science in the 19th century commanded a low status and was identified with useful knowledge. Horner stressed both the economic rationale and social control agendas. Quote, workmen would derive the greatest advantage not only from the increased skill but from the sober habits it would encourage. Attending the Edinburgh School of Arts would save a tradesman, quote, from the dissipation and evil consequences of the public house, argued Horner. The economic appeal of the early institutes was not, as is often supposed, due to the increased division of labour in the factories. The typical workman, artisan, attending the Edinburgh School of Arts was a cabinet maker, mason, carpenter or print worker working on his own or in a small enterprise. Horner's vision for the first Mechanics Institute was to provide scientific education for discrete subcategories of artisans and not for the working class as a whole. The rationale was to permit the economy to function without skill bottlenecks, to facilitate a small degree of social mobility and to exercise social control over the mechanics. The fee for two sessions from October 1821 was 15 shillings. The problem of finding suitable premises was solved when the Grand Lodge of Scotland granted the use of the Freemasons Hall, Nidri Street. St Cecilia's Concert Hall is within this building, adorned by its glorious cupola, and this was where the Edinburgh School of Arts was launched on the 16th of October, 1821. At this time, the state had barely intervened on the terrain of the philanthropic elite, such as Horner, in providing education for the working classes. Initiatives such as the Edinburgh School of Arts were strongly opposed by most Tories, who viewed the institutes with suspicion as potential nests of revolution and political dissent, but a minority displayed a spirit of enlightenment. David Brewster, a leading physicist and ardent Tory, made a clumsy attempt to sabotage and take over the school and subsume it within the Society of Arts for Scotland. The attempt was defeated and the Scotsman newspaper described Horner as bland in his manners, tolerant in his spirit and honourable in his principles and no bias from politics would be yielded to. Although the takeover bid was spearheaded by Tories, Horner was astute enough to realise that he needed the support of some prominent Tories who would be part of the school's management. Consequently, he recruited Sir Walter Scott as his most prominent Tory subscriber. 
Some 350 people made donations to the school. The management was entrusted to 18 directors, all of whom were subscribers, the majority of whom were gentlemen of the Whig upper middle classes. Horner always maintained that students should have no role in the management, although from 1835, three directors were chosen from among the former students of the school. An audience of 272 students, the directors, subscribers and several most distinguished individuals packed St Cecilia's Hall for the inaugural meeting on the 16th of October 1821, while hundreds of people could not gain admission. The objects of the institution were explained by Horner in a short but luminous address, followed by the first chemistry lecture by Dr Andrew Fife. The packed audience at St Cecilia's Hall on that autumnal evening in 1821 would not have realised the significance of the meeting. That night was the birth of the Mechanics Institute movement that would subsequently spread throughout Britain and abroad. Within a month, over 452 students had registered at a fee of 15 shillings per annum. Utilitarian philosophy infused with Calvinism, reflecting a limited approach, permeated Horner's opening speech. Quote, the School of Arts had been founded for the purpose of giving you real and substantial instruction and not to amuse a vacant hour or excite your wonder by exhibiting some showy experiments. Horner further stressed that by occupying your leisure hours in the improvement of your mind and as you withdraw from frivolous and useless occupations, to say nothing of those that are injurious to your health and morals, you will add respectability to your station as members of society. Hence there was an underlying assumption that there was something especially effective about scientific education in achieving social control of the working class by transforming their values, behaviour and morals to make them more docile and better disciplined. Consequently, knowledge, morals and manners were to be altered by the same educational process. Class division was viewed both in social and in intellectual terms. As Francis Jeffrey, a subscriber to the School of Arts, argued in 1825, of all the derangements that can take place, one of the most embarrassing and discreditable would be those which arose from working classes becoming more intelligent than their employers. Horner adopted a rigid utilitarian concept of what was deemed appropriate for the minds of working class artisans by offering them a very Spartan educational nourishment during the first year of the School of Arts, chemistry, mechanical philosophy and architecture. He rejected proposals for lectures on astronomy, geology and phrenology and justified this decision in patronising terms. It will be easy to introduce many parts of science which would attract by striking phenomena and draw a very crowded audience, but this could not be done without sacrificing subjects of far higher value. Hence the benefits to be expected from an education at the School of Arts went far beyond the narrow curriculum on offer. Surprisingly, maths, the subject first mentioned in Horner's discussion with Bryson, was not offered. But some 30 students, realising that their knowledge of maths was insufficient to understand the natural philosophy lectures, formed themselves into a class under a joiner, James Yule, who agreed to teach gratuitously one session a week. A second class was also formed under a cabinet maker, David Dewar. The directors introduced formal maths teaching during the second year, and these students were also required to attend a session every Saturday evening to examine them on the work they had gone over. One wonders how many of today's students or staff would be willing to participate in viva voce in maths tests every Saturday night. In an era when few working class households could afford to purchase books, provision of a library was critical. There was a narrow vision concerning the scope of the library and its contents. 
Only books on mechanics and chemistry and on all branches of natural and physical sciences would be allowed, and the director shall have the entire control of the books that are to be admitted. Concerns about the possibility of unsuitable reading corrupting the minds of the Edinburgh working classes led Horner to introduce an indispensable rule that no newspaper shall be brought to this room, nor any other books read in it than such as relate to the objects of the institution. Religious and political and economy literature were also banned, seen as a fatuous distraction from the serious business of learning. Edinburgh Blackwood's magazine asserted that the mass of mechanics are grossly ignorant. Everyone knows that a profusion of most pernicious publications would incessantly court their attention. By the opening date, the library was stocked with around 400 books and the directors opened the library on those evenings when there was no lecture, when 30 to 50 men were found studying with silence and attention. The educational ethos would have met with the unreserved approval of Thomas Gradgrind. It was to be 15 years in 1842 before the directors granted permission to introduce books of poetry, biography and history. The Mechanics Institute movement, although related to the needs of a section of the working class, was not initiated by them. William Cobbett expounded sarcastically over the initiative to fill us with intellect brought ready bottled up from north of the Tweed. It is clear that Horner and the Scottish Whigs, who pioneered the Mechanics Institute movement in Edinburgh, did not subscribe to a conflict model of society, but to one of conservative ameliorative action in order to modify skilled working class culture and behaviour. The assertion of this link between science and behaviour was proclaimed regularly at the AGMs of the school. The Reverend Andrew Thompson asserted in his address of the 7th of June 1825 that it was the business of the Edinburgh School of Arts to rescue the lower orders from the power of temptations, to elevate them far above the grossness of sensuality and its grovelling pleasures, and train them to habits of purity, sobriety and correct deportment. Hence the directors of the School of Arts and its subscribers were not radicals. The stark social divisions of Edinburgh society, with its gross inequalities in housing, wealth, employment and health, were not questioned by them. The vision of social advancement offered to the working class artisans was a very narrow one. Only the exceptional man could be expected to achieve social mobility, or as Horner said, I hope that other Watts and Rennies will arise within the walls of the Edinburgh School of Arts. It was assumed that the children of the working classes would themselves become manual workers and that they should receive an education appropriate to their station in life. Subsequently, mechanics institutes created social barriers within the working classes and limited the upward mobility of labour into the middle classes. The Reverend Thomas Chalmers, who addressed the students in June 1824, underlined the permanence of a rigid class structure. The capitalists must still be the few, and to the end of time the artisans must compose the vast multitude of our species. The zeal of Horner and the Edinburgh elite was directed to filling a gap in educational provision that was not met by the market while exercising social control, improving the morals and behaviour of artisans, but maintaining the existing rigidity of the class structure. Mechanics Institutes, therefore, reflected a sense of class consciousness that involved an awareness by the working man that they would always be working men. Horner did not provide free education for Edinburgh's artisans, but he also encouraged the more opulent classes of Edinburgh to support the scheme. The accounts for the first year show that 40% of the income was derived from student fees and 60% from subscriptions. The ideas of Horner were severely criticised by certain Tories, most notably by the anonymous country gentleman, who argued that our ancestors wisely confined the superior sort of education 
to birth and wealth, and there is no justification for altering the distribution of knowledge in society and every reason for keeping it as it is. Similarly, Blackwood's Edinburgh Magazine, in May 1825, warned its readers that whenever the lower orders of any state have obtained a smattering of knowledge, they have generally used it to produce national ruin. It continued that the Mechanics Institute movement was calculated to take the working class from the guidance of their superiors, to dissolve the bonds between rich and poor, create insubordination and to injure industry, good workmanship and morals. The creation of the Edinburgh School of Arts by Horner in 1821 stimulated the formation of other institutes so that by the end of 1823 there were five in Scotland in Edinburgh, Glasgow, Greenock, Haddington and Kilmarnock, in addition to one in London, which later became Birkbeck College. Horner was also involved in advising other new institutes concerning governance and the curriculum, especially the Manchester Institution, where Benjamin Haywood, the Unitarian founder, referred to Horner's School of Arts as an institution for which we are all indebted for the groundwork of our regulations. The Manchester founders also looked to Horner for their educational strategy as he pioneered a system of graduated instruction over several years. The influence of the Edinburgh School of Arts became global, extending to Australia from Scotland as early as the 1830s. The Reverend J.D. Lang arrived in Sydney from Scotland in 1823 and was the first Presbyterian minister to officiate in New South Wales. He observed that there were Irish Catholics in New South Wales and his violently expressed prejudices against these Irish Catholics motivated him to organise four shipments of emigrants from Scotland. The religious prejudices that underlay his immigration schemes were frequently at odds with government officials in Australia and at the age of 60 he was horsewhipped in the street. He chartered a ship, the Stirling Castle, in 1831 and filled it with 52 Scottish mechanics and their families to take them to Sydney. In keeping with the Calvinistic tone of the initiative, he decided to devote the months at sea to the moral and intellectual enlightenment of the mechanics. Five days a week of the four-month voyage were devoted to the study of arithmetic and geometry taught by the Reverend Henry Carmichael. And those who had attended the Edinburgh School of Arts finished six books of Euclid and logarithms before the ship reached Port Jackson. After departure from the Cape of Good Hope, there was twice weekly instruction in political economy and some 30 mechanics worked their way through the first two books of Adam Smith's The Wealth of Nations. The Reverend Carmichael was invited by the Governor of New South Wales to establish a mechanics institute in the colony. This venture was an immediate success and recorded a membership of 812 by 1841, including one-third of the Stirling Castle immigrants. The only first-hand account of the Edinburgh School of Arts from its inception is that of James Naismith, who enrolled as a student aged 13 in 1821, and he refers to an alcove opposite the lecturer where it might often be seen the directors of the institution, Geoffrey, Horner, Murray and others, dignifying by their presence this noble gathering of earnest working men. This was a clear manifestation of the social control agenda of the Whig founders in action. Naismith became one of the greatest engineers of the Industrial Revolution. Only one year after completing his studies at the Edinburgh School of Arts in 1827, at the age of 19, Naismith displayed his inventive flair by constructing a road steam carriage and successful trials were carried out on the Queen's Ferry Road some two years before Stevenson's rocket was tested at the Rainhill Trials. Naismith founded the Bridgewater Foundry at Patricroft in 1836, where he developed a six-ton steam hanner the crowning achievement of his genius, which could break an eggshell in a wine glass and was one of the great inventions of the Industrial Revolution. 
Meanwhile, Horner and his directors resisted any broadening of the curriculum until they initiated lecture courses in the summer of 1837 on natural history, geology and English language. But they continued to confine the winter programme to chemistry, mechanical philosophy and maths. Although Horner's institution was the exemplar for many others and an inspiration for the whole movement, its success was misleading. As early as 1824, Horner wrote to the Home Secretary Sir Robert Peel, arguing that similar institutions were making two great errors. One, the management is left in the hands of mechanics, and two, they teach too many subjects, many of which are of no utility to the mechanic. In general, the survival of mechanics institutes depended directly on the degree to which they abandoned their original purpose. Although a product of utilitarian social philosophy, subsequent success, especially in England, tended to occur only as the utilitarian motive was diluted. The second error made by the pioneers of the movement was the assumption that the working man was interested only in the skills related to his trade. Most men for whom the tuition was intended, especially in England, were unequipped to cope with the scientific topics. The demand for science simply melted away. Most mechanics departed English institutes and were replaced by the petty bourgeoisie, clerks, shopkeepers and drapers, for whom literature, travel, phrenology, biography and history were substituted for sciences. Literary lectures embrace such diverse topics as the funeral rites of various nations, the customs of Eskimos, the games of Greece and the theosophy of India. Clearly the lower middle class clientele worshipped at the feet of Apollo but not Minerva. Many institutes, especially in rural areas, abandoned any pretense at being a mechanics institute. For example, Charles Dickens' famed career as a dramatic reader began at the Birmingham Institute in 1853. Even the Manchester Institute, although advised initially by Horner and modelled on Edinburgh, was being animated by a new tune. Benjamin Haywood introduced a gymnastics class in 1832, an excursion by rail to Liverpool in 1833, a Christmas party and a cricket club in 1834 and a concert in 1837, all far removed from Horner's original mission to educate skilled artisans in scientific principles. By the 1840s, the systematic science courses that had been the raison d'etre of the early institutes, especially in Scotland, gave way to a programme embracing popular science, literature, music, history, travel and phrenology, which attracted a lower middle class rather than a working class audience. This broader curriculum enabled the movement to develop. By 1841, there were 300 mechanics institutes in Britain. By 1851, this had expanded to 698, with a total of 110,000 members. The origins of the Mechanics Institutes varied according to local circumstances, but in general, the lead was taken by middle-class Whigs, utilitarians and reformed-minded civic leaders who realised that it was in their interest that their employees should be better educated. The Mechanics Institute movement asserted the common man's right to share in a culture that did not end with a knowledge of the steam engine and the Christian theory of social subordination. While directors deplored the competition provided by the public house, they ignored the growing popularity of the pleasure garden, the dancing saloon and the music hall. A narrow scientific curriculum was unattractive to most working men. What they sought was relaxation from their daily toil, a place to air their opinions, a spirit of fellowship, a pipe, a pint and papers with working class sympathies. Horner departed for London in 1827 to take up the wardenship of the University of London. Throughout his life as the leading factory inspector, Horner made periodic visits to the School of Arts and in a speech in 1851, 
some 30 years after he founded the Mechanics Institute movement. He was scathing of other institutes for not restricting themselves to a specific course of instruction. They take up a variety of subjects with no bearing on professional education of mechanics and treat them superficially. The first hint of a relaxation in the narrow curriculum of the Edinburgh School began to surface. Ornamental modelling was introduced in 1835 and a series of lecture courses including natural history, geology and mineralogy, physiology and a class on the structure of the English language were introduced during the summer of 1837. A thriving French class was also introduced from 1843. The winter programme, however, was largely restricted to the core disciplines only, i.e. maths, natural philosophy and chemistry. The predominant emphasis on teaching science to the working classes of Edinburgh remained, so that by 1851, Hudson, in his book on the history of adult education, declared that the Edinburgh School of Arts is the only establishment in Britain deserving the title of People's College. By 1839-40, the socio-economic mix of students enrolled at the Edinburgh School of Arts had broadened, but skilled manual workers still constituted 63% of the student body, compared with only 26% at Manchester, while intermediate non-manual workers, mainly clerks, shopkeepers and drapers, had expanded to 25% of the total in Edinburgh. In 1828, the directors developed the syllabus into a two-year course of study, maths and chemistry in the first year, with higher maths and mechanical philosophy in year two. In the early 1760s, Robert Adam had built two handsome houses with large bay windows with the old college buildings on the south, forming Adam Square, later demolished to form Chamber Street and it became the new home of the School of Arts in 1837. The Adam Square building was purchased for £2,500 in 1851, whereupon the school adopted the nomenclature Watt Institution and School of Arts. By the middle of the 19th century, the permanence and utility of the school, despite its austere programme, seemed a settled issue. Its influence on the development of other institutes was profound, and ownership of its own building signalled confidence in the future. The 1870s witnessed the peak period for the introduction of new subjects into the curriculum, and by the end of the decade, the institution had developed a large portfolio of science, social science and humanities subjects. The criterion of direct utility in the workplace had been relaxed, although the directors continued to assert in 1878-79 that they had only introduced new classes in which there is a systematic course of teaching on subjects of real practical interest. Quite how subjects such as life and nature painting, draped life model, Hebrew, Sanskrit, Hindustani and the theory of music, which were sanctioned by the directors, satisfied this utilitarian criterion was not explained. The diversification of the subject range was not entirely inconsistent with the philosophy of the institution. The Edinburgh School of Arts was founded so that the demand for, of the skilled working class for education could be satisfied. And in the late 19th century, these needs were broader than in the 1820s. The flowering of new subjects reflected the rapid growth of student numbers, the decline in the proportion of manual workers attending, the changing demands of the Edinburgh labour market and the admission of women. Recruitment of women became a topic of discussion at a directors' meeting in 1869. Not that women were in themselves an innovation in 1869, but at the Watt Institution they certainly were. The key figure in the campaign to secure female entry was the redoubtable Mary Burton, who made trailblazing inroads into public life at a time when prevailing notions of social respectability decreed that a lady's place was in the drawing room. Initially, women made up around 10% of all the students in 1872-73, and until the mid-1880s, women made up around 15% of the intake. 
at this time, Glasgow University segregated men from women by installing a wooden partition in the humanities classroom, which permitted only the lecturer to see both genders at once. The Watt Institution, however, never taught men and women separately. Even in the late 19th century, commentators were acutely aware that mechanics institutes had failed to attract large numbers of working class students. The banquet was prepared for guests who did not come. Working people, for the most part, after 10 or more hours labour each day, resisted flogging their intellects till bedtime through manuals of chemistry or natural philosophy. One obvious area of achievement was in greatly boosting the library movement and the development of local museums. Horner had created an institution that had succeeded despite severe financial constraints and had a secure basis on which to ultimately develop into a flourishing global university. The reality is that this complex university today, originally conceived to offer educational opportunities for the working classes of Edinburgh, successively overwritten by technical college utilitarianism, meritocratic striving and worldwide engagement, has survived for 200 years. It is possible even now to be aware that the world's first ever mechanics institute is the spiritual ancestor of Harriet Watt University, as an ethos of applied useful learning, first articulated by our founder Leonard Horner, still permeates the lecture and seminar rooms to this day. <laughs>